Well, thanks a lot for well, your kind invitation. It's great to be well, in this beautiful city. And it's also very good that the previous speaker has provided us with, well, um, with, with a very nice variety of examples of how fundamental rights could be relevant uh, to uh, what's happening now in the digital era. And actually what I will do uh, during um, the last 30 minutes um, is take a look, a closer look at the EU perspective, particularly at uh, what, well, basically your last slide uh, with, well, EU law and how it works out there. So um, I will basically uh, take it up from where you ended. So I hope that we will have some continuity uh, rather than overlap. So, um, well, but uh, let me very briefly introduce the topic because this discussion may seem new but uh, in fact it has uh, started many years ago and Germany has been particularly famous of course for um, its quite uh, well revolutionary uh, well constitutional court which tried to link fundamental rights to private law uh, which, because originally, indeed, as Peter has also pointed out, fundamental rights and private law were two separate fields which didn't really communicate uh, with each other. So today we see the growing impact of fundamental rights and not only in national legal systems, not only in Germany, uh, which still provides us probably with the most exciting examples of how it works, but at the EU level, the idea has also been accepted in a way that fundamental rights and private law um, well, are related, that private law is supposed uh, to be in conformity with uh, fundamental rights. And the Treaty of the European Union recognizes three sources of such rights. One of them is the Charter, which has become binding, uh, and uh, well, two others are European Convention of Human Rights and Constitutional Traditions of the member states. So, um, the questions that I would like to address are in a why more, um, uh, well, also both practical uh, but also um, uh, theoretical in a why. So, the first one is basically how EU fundamental rights can influence private law and in particular shape consumer protection. So this goes uh, directly here to the last slide of uh, our previous speaker. The next one is to what extent should they do so? Uh, so this implies in a way a normative question because as I will also highlight, uh, the application of fundamental rights to private law relationships is not straightforward. Uh, it's, it, it, it adds complexity and it may not necessarily help consumers in all cases. And and, well, the, the, the last question that I would like to address and to discuss with you is basically whether the digitalization of the marketplace and societies that we are witnessing now, whether it adds a new dimension to the constitutionalization of EU private law. To what extent eh, are we seeing something new? Is it new? Eh, so. Uh, three main issues uh, to be discussed um, in the next 30 minutes. Um, but first, let me uh, outline four gateways to the impact of EU fundamental rights on private law. And uh, I think one of them has already been mentioned, but uh, for the sake of consistency and just to have an overview, it seems to be helpful uh, just to see what, how fundamental rights can actually have impact. And, well, the, probably the first, the most obvious one um, uh, widely accepted is that EU legislation as well as national legislation implementing EU law also in private law matters has to be in conformity with EU fundamental rights. And um, it sounds obvious, um, perhaps, but in practice it, um, well, does lead to many uh, practical questions because what uh, the EU measures also in the field of private law often do, they basically, um, well, contain recitals which say that this particular measure, well, respects this and that fundamental right. 
And uh, the use of these recitals can be very helpful in order to be able to interpret this measure in case of a dispute about its meaning in the light of the charter. The problem is that not all measures in the area of private law contain these recitals, contain references to fundamental rights. For instance, we see the reference to fundamental rights in the Consumer Credit Directive, uh, just a variety of fundamental rights uh, which are relevant uh, to it, which suggests that the directive is not um, in conflict with these rights, but no such reference has been included in the Mortgage Credit Directive. Well, there is. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to explain, but this is, of course, the reality of the political process also at the EU level. So, uh, the second gateway uh, to the impact of fundamental rights is um, um, the interpretation and uh, application of EU law and national laws within the scope of EU law in conformity with fundamental rights. Of course, here comes the trick. Eh? We are not talking about eh, all private law eh? because, indeed, the application of EU fundamental rights is constrained by competence eh? and only EU, basically, uh, national law, which falls within the scope of EU law, also um, falls um, under the scope of this obligation. Eh? So that national courts and all other authorities are obliged to interpret and apply it in conformity with fundamental rights. And what it means, it means basically that it has to be implemented, well, well, the member states have this obligation when they're implementing EU directives, but also when they're derogating from, um, uh, for instance, free movement provisions, primary EU law, based on public policy exceptions. Public policy exceptions also have to be interpreted in the light of fundamental rights, which, well, opens up the way uh, to uh, the impact. Um, so, um, well, what I have not mentioned, but uh, this is also the, the, this abbreviation, U, e, well, ERPL, it refers uh, to, uh, well, European private law more generally, but particular also to the European regulatory private law, because mostly what comes from uh, the EU, it's, it's, it's regulatory law in the sense that it pursues public objectives, uh, such as the creation of the internal market and consumer protection. Well, and here, perhaps so far, uh, if we look at these first two gateways, we, had, we were talking basically about the um, negative obligations, negative obligations of the UN member states, so the obligations not to interfere with fundamental rights. But what we also have, and this is quite underdeveloped in EU law still, is the concept of positive obligations, which might be interesting, particularly given the novelty of the problems uh, that we are witnessing here. Um, but so the question is, do EU and member state have positive obligations to protect fundamental rights in private relationships? Uh, and uh, such an obligation exists in particular under the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, in Germany, of course, uh, there, there have been uh, some cases which, uh, which accepted, um, which, which, which have clearly accepted the existence of such an obligation. But in EU law, it is currently quite underdeveloped when it comes to the fundamental rights protection. What we see, for instance, in Commission uh, uh, well, uh, versus France is that uh, the free movements, uh, the free movement of goods, for instance, has been granted this, uh, well, has been seen as a kind of, well, uh, uh, free movement provision, uh, free, fundamental freedom, which gives rise to positive obligations of member state, so that they do something actively, proactively to protect fundamental rights, uh, to protect fundamental freedoms in this case, against, for instance, the actions of uh, angry farmers who are destroying goods uh, from coming from member states. So we have something like that, but we do not have something like that with respect, uh, to my knowledge, uh, with respect to fundamental rights. But of course, what we uh, still uh, uh, have is fundamental rights acting um, as a kind of source of inspiration for rule makers at EU and national level to adopt legislation which promotes EU fundamental rights. 
So I would say that in this case we are talking about a kind of weak version of um, positive obligations, so that the EU legislator basically steps in in order to, uh, to do something. Um, but again, uh, so this is of course, this, is, uh, this cannot be compared with, uh, with the hard uh, version that we see in the context of free movements at the moment. And finally, the direct horizontal effect of EU fundamental rights. Uh, in fact, this is not a new phenomena. Well, I've just understood that there has been a new case, but uh, Defrene, of course, a very old case, is an example of the direct horizontal effect of uh, EU fundamental rights, in particular of the principle of equal pay for men and women. So in some instances, well, we may not need to fall back on legislation, be it uh, EU legislation or national implementing, but just directly invoke certain fundamental rights against other private parties. But again, to my knowledge, this concept has been very limited still. Uh, the uh, Court of Justice has, has not really expanded its application to all <laughs> fundamental rights. So uh, it, it is something which is still uh, not widely accepted and quite widely criticized, uh, because this is from a private law perspective a very, uh, of course, the most far-reaching instrument. And um, again, but still it, it can be interesting and in some cases it can be used uh, indeed uh, so that private parties can just rely on a fundamental right directly in the relationships with each other, which is again very revolutionary from the private law perspective. Uh, so. Um, these are the gateways, as we see, negative obligations, pos possibly positive obligations, weak at least, direct horizontal effect. But again, uh, these concepts are, in, well, are developing. Uh, it's, uh, the EU law in this area is very new, and uh, I think that it is really interesting to see uh, whether digitalization, the digitalization era uh, in itself will... Um, well, maybe uh, prompt uh, further development of that. Um, let me also illustrate some more practical uh, aspects now of how fundamental rights can actually influence consumer protection. Well, now that we are armed with these concepts uh, in the why, we have an overview of how it works. Um, I suggest that we take a look at uh, the actual and potential impact of EU fundamental rights on private law, and in particular um, take the case of consumer credit as an example, because as we've heard in Latvia, there have been also many problems with consumer credit, and this has been uh, also an EU-wide problem, the mis-selling of consumer credit, in particular payday loans, uh, not only by uh, well traditional uh, banking institutions, but also by non-banking, in particular by, I would say, by non-banking institutions. And uh, the relevant piece of legislation, uh, Consumer Credit Directive, is currently under review. So, um, well, it could be a, an interesting case just to see how fundamental rights could be of relevance here. And three aspects, of course, are important, um, well, in the online, but also in the offline world. Uh, access to credit, basically substantive consumer protection, how are you protected once you've got access, you've got your credit, what happens then? And finally, if you have a problem, if you have a dispute with your credit uh, provider, what then? So procedural aspects um, may also uh, come into play here. So um, the problem, of course, uh, well, the, the uh, regulators are facing in this area has to do with the need to strike a right and appropriate balance between uh, financial inclusion and consumer protection. On the one hand, uh, we need, of course, consumers to be able to get access to credit, um, uh, well, to be able to have credit, um, to finance their ongoing expenses, uh, to buy a car, to go to work, etc. At the same time, however, we also need them to be protected. If we protect them too much, particularly vulnerable consumers may not have access to credit 
from traditional lenders anymore. So too much protection means financial exclusion in many cases, but too little protection means over-indebtedness for consumers. Um, and this is a very, very difficult uh, balancing act which needs to be, um, uh, well, uh, taken into account by any regulator, be it uh, at EU level or national level. And, of course, if we look at the uh, fundamental rights level, how fundamental rights come in and what impact they may have here, we see, of course, that there are conflicts, potential conflicts possible here as well. And uh, it is, of course, no right on the side of a consumer is absolute. It needs to be balanced, always needs to be balanced uh, with the creditors' rights. Whether it happens in practice is another matter. But mostly the conflicts between fundamental rights in the context of consumer protection, provision of consumer credit arise, for example, between the principle of non-discrimination, um, respect for private and family life, protection of personal data, and the principle of consumer protection, yeah, which is considered to be part of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So these are the rights which typically um, well, which pl can play a role and uh, whose application may turn uh, in favor of consumers. But they will need to be balanced, of course, by the rights of creditors um, and other uh, providers, basically businesses, uh, which include freedom to conduct a business. Uh, this fundamental right comprises also freedom of contract. So basically the traditional private law, freedom of contract, is protected also at the constitutional level. The right to property uh, is another one, of course, which has an important role uh, to play when it comes to the interests of uh, businesses. So the conflicts are uh, unavoidable because we are talking here about horizontal relationships. We are talking here about the uh, two private parties, both of which um, need uh, to be, uh, well, the, the constitutional uh, rights of, of, of uh, each of them need to be taken into account. And um, if we take access, if we, for instance, look at access to credit um, from this, well, uh, negative obligations perspective, eh, so that um, eh, there should be no interference with the consumer's right uh, to... Um, get credit, um, then, of course, we are talking here about non-discrimination. Yeah? Non-discrimination in the provision of consumer credit. And uh, as, uh, well, Peter's presentation has uh, shown, of course, algorithmic credit scoring raises huge concerns when it comes to the negative dimension of fundamental rights protection. Yeah? We see that, that basically discrimination here is probably one of the major problems. And what makes it so difficult is that if this is an automa automated decision making, you don't even know. Eh? You, it's very difficult to control it. <laughs> when is it discriminating? Eh? Maybe at the moment when you have checked it, it was all right, but the day after it has learned something else and started discriminating. What often also happens is that it could be not um, a programmed, pre-programmed discrimination, eh? but just because people with a certain name live in particular areas, eh? they all get a higher interest rate, ultimately. Not because of their name, finally, but because of a certain area, eh? in a certain district in a city where eh, the default rate is eh, higher than an average, on average. So, um, very big issues. And, um, of course, um, what we see here is when it comes to legislation, it is clear that EU legislation cannot discriminate itself. Eh? So, test a charts case was here an example when basically the insurers were prevented from using different premiums for men and women. Um, and... In a way, so it is clear that in, in the legislation there can be no discrimination. But of course, when it comes to uh, cases where legislation is all right, eh, there is nothing wrong about the court's interpretation, eh, but still uh, 
this uh, it is basically um, um, well uh, an algorithm which is discriminating this becomes quite tricky because uh, it's about evidence it's about tracking this down uh, even if you know that you have a fundamental right how do you uh, basically realize it so um, the problems are here obvious when we look at the positive dimension so that the EU and member states are required to take active measures to uh, combat discrimination, for instance, in el well, through algorithmic scoring. What then? And um, in terms of, of course, combating uh, discrimination, um, th the question is, what is, for instance, consumer credit? Fundamental rights could provide an interesting um, well, perhaps, um, um, well, inspiration here to um, qualify consumer credit as a fundamental right. Eh? I'm not suggesting that this should be done, but it is possible to, for instance, argue that, uh, okay, consumer credit is so essential to consumers these days that it can be considered to be a service of general economic interest. Eh? Well, based on the, inter for instance, on uh, the charter and the principle of consumer protection in the charter. And then um, to use the same logic which has, for instance, been used uh, also in the payment accounts directive, which granted all consumers the right to a basic bank account. Okay. So the question is, okay, can we use fundamental rights so as to promote uh, well, the existence of a right to credit. Um, well, this is indeed, um, there are many, of course, objections also to this view, eh, that there is the right to credit because obviously there is a difference between eh, the right um, uh, to credit and the right to a basic bank account. The intrusion into the creditor's freedom of contract is much greater, but also from the consumer protection perspective, we may ask serious questions. Do we really want consumers to see credit um, as their right? Eh? It's, it can, of course, also eh, mean over-indebtedness and many problems. Um, so uh, many, uh, well, uh, problematic issues here. But, but, and this is when it comes to po the positive dimension of fundamental rights protection. Of course, the EU legislator can always step in and combat discrimination through a borrower-focused creditworthiness assessment, basically by precluding the use of certain data which are currently eh, probably used to the detriment of consumers. And this may include, of course, uh, well, the use of Facebook eh, and uh, how much time someone is eh, on the Facebook and many other big data, the use of which is extremely questionable from the point of view of consumer credit worthiness assessment. So if eh, the consumer credit directive starts proactively uh, um, in a way, uh, encourages and imposes a clear obligation on creditors to perform a borrower-focused, consumer borrower-focused test and to use only data which are relevant for the purposes, then, well, this kind of in, well, discrimination which we are talking about could be avoided. Uh, so, indirect effect of fundamental rights on legislation which, uh, uh, which then um, takes a more proactive approach. Um, so, uh, when it comes to uh, substantive consumer protection, an interesting, of course, uh, case could be whether uh, certain uh, financial products, in particular credit products like payday loans, uh, could be banned uh, altogether. And uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, well, this payday loans, which again eh, caused much pro many problems here in Latvia, but well, the, in, in the Netherlands we didn't have any problems with them because the Dutch financial watchdog was very proactive and just basically, uh, well, banned them. Um, so this is interesting, uh, but from the EU law perspective, the question here is whether EU fundamental rights could be of any use here. And the Omega case, which some of you maybe uh, may know, of course, may provide an interesting 
um, inspiration for this line of reasoning because in Omega what happened was that the, uh, it was an administrative law case, the Bond police authority uh, banned um, a certain um, laser drone killing game which was produced by two uh, companies, one of them uh, was Germany and uh, another one uh, was British, so they were basically cooperating with each other. And what happened was that ultimately, um, uh, well, because of that prohibition, they could not bring their killing, killing uh, play on a market. They challenged the prohibition, uh, the administrative law prohibition in Germany based on the free movement uh, provisions because they said that this uh, prohibition was contrary to their uh, free movement uh, of goods. And uh, basically what uh, the point uh, here was that the European Court of Justice allowed member states to justify their prohibitions of free movements based on fundamental rights, in particular the right to human dignity uh, in that particular case. So this was a very interesting case also from the private law perspective, although it, it didn't relate to private law as such, but um, it, this kind of reasoning could also play a role in a, in a potentially in a private law context, when we don't have EU legislation eh, saying that, well, authorities may prohibit certain products, we don't have that in the area of credit at EU level at the moment, and then if such a situation as an Omega comes in in a private law context, potentially eh, we may um, end up in it with a conflict uh, between free movement of goods or services in this case and uh, fundamental rights, and fundamental rights may ultimately prevail. In particular, the right, the, the principle of consumer protection, with, which is in the Charter, could play a role. Uh, so ultimately, I think this principle, I, I, I understand also the skepticism <laughs> um, around it, but, well, I think it is not excluded that it, in certain cases it may play an important role, ultimately. And... Um, Obviously, of course, this principle, together with other fundamental rights that I've just mentioned on the right of consumer, they may also encourage the adoption of more protective legislation, which may be suitable for consumer protection in the digital age, yeah. like creditworthiness assessment, which excludes some discriminatory scoring, and um, also uh, it maybe even product governance rules for certain dangerous consumer credit, for all consumer credit products, which may ultimately preclude uh, some dangerous uh, products from being brought on the market. Um, well, just very briefly, uh, the, again, the same, I think, logic applies also to uh, procedural consumer protection uh, when there is a dispute. Um, we've seen, particularly in this area, that fundamental rights have already played a very important role in the case law of the European Court of Justice, uh, particularly in um, Aziz, where uh, they, well, the right to uh, the consumer's home, um, well, played indirectly a role in the court proceedings and um, basically allowed, um, well, uh, ultimately led to the uh, revision of national civil procedural laws which allowed the consumer, uh, for the consumer to lose his or her home before it was clear, uh, before the judgment was made as to whether or not the contract, uh, the standard contract terms in the related mortgage contract were unfair. So, very, I will not go into detail, this, is, uh, this could be a presentation, well, <laughs> in itself, but the point here that a fundamental right to consumer's home was taken into account um, indirectly in that case by the European Court of Justice to prevent the, the consumer from losing his home. We don't have such really um, striking cases in the area of consumer credit, simple consumer credit yet, but still it shows, of course, uh, the relevance, the relevance of a fundamental rights dimension, particularly in really harsh cases when much is at stake and uh, the fairness of certain national laws can be really questioned. But again, fundamental rights remain in a way a double-edged sword that, uh, well, it, there, there have been also decisions of courts at national level. 
uh, for instance, where uh, not the uh, consumer has ultimately won, won based on fundamental argument, uh, fundamental rights arguments, but it was rather uh, a professional party. Uh, and this has to do, again, with the unpredictability, in my way still, of the balancing exercise performed between the various fundamental rights, which makes, of course, the recourse to fundamental rights not always uh, safe for consumers. And uh, the British case, uh, basically the uh, Wilson, uh, which uh, provides a nice illustration here, what was at stake was the compatibility of one of the provisions of the uh, English Consumer Credit Act um, with uh, fundamental rights, and uh, that provision basically precluded creditors from enforcing credit agreements which were not on paper, which didn't state all details duly on paper. And uh, in case this, uh, basically there was no agreement on paper containing all details, they couldn't even enforce securities eh, over certain property, uh, over, well, uh, that they have got, eh, like uh, cars eh, for which credit was uh, provided or so. And in, what is interesting here is that the Court of Appeal, the English Court of Appeal, basically found that this provision of uh, the Consumer Credit Act was incompatible with uh, the uh, creditor's fundamental right to property uh, because it was just such a blunt, uh, well, sanction for misstating maybe the amount of credit uh, in the consumer credit agreement. And, uh, well, the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, arrived at a to a different conclusion and said, okay, uh, well, it is... Um, basically sovereignty of parliament, we, are, we do not interfere here with the, um, with the legislator's approach. So, um, ultimately, uh, the consumer protection legislation prevailed, so the interests of consumers prevailed in this case, but again, as this dispute between two high courts illustrates, this may not necessarily be the case. Um, so, to conclude, um, I think that, uh, well, if the, the impact of EU fundamental rights on private law may definitely lead to groundbreaking solutions uh, to important societal problems, um, particularly problems that could not uh, uh, be resolved yet uh, via a legislative process at EU or national level. And irresponsible consumer credit lending, which has uh, troubled the consumer credit markets, is a wonderful illustration. But we should be cautious that uh, it's, uh, it, this may not always be the case. So it is ultimately a balancing exercise. And what we, of course, also see is that we should be uh, well aware that the uh, unbridled constitutionalization of private law may basically move uh, the debate on some extremely sensitive issues, uh, political, social, economic issues, away from the legislative process to the level of fundamental rights, particularly when it comes to um, this balance uh, between access to credit and, and uh, protection, uh, consumer protection. This is a very extremely delicate exercise. And, well, resolving it, ex well, doing it at the level of fundamental rights may probably not be the best thing and could be reserved, should be probably reserved to the most hard, to, to the hardest cases. And ultimately, and I was very much intrigued also by the title of, uh, of, the, of the conference, um, I w I'm just, I think a very fundamental question, which applies not only to the area of private law and fundamental rights, but also to all other areas is, is there something new here? Oh, like, is the digital era bringing uh, something so new uh, into uh, well this discourse that we can say that we can speak about new frontiers, new balance, uh, well between whatever different interests. Um, what is so new? Uh, because of course the problem of uh, the imbalance of power uh, it's a very it's, it's, this problem is quite old, and I would uh, agree that uh, the digitalization process makes it.
uh, worse. Uh, it, I think the digitalization, particularly in the area of private relationships, it increases the imbalance of power uh, between actors because uh, big actors, particularly those uh, in a dominant position, they simply know too much, much more than they used to, uh, even a couple, well, a decade ago. This is a problem, but in terms of concepts uh, that we have, does this really lead to something new under the sun? Or do we just need to basically to, um, well, upgrade also our knowledge of old problems and to use uh, maybe the concepts that are there more creatively to address the contemporary issues? Thank you very much. Have a questions? No? I think it was such a detailed presentation replying to all questions which we have in the concept of the conference. So thank you so much, Olga. And uh, I think we have to reflect a little bit about... I also have more questions than uh, answers, answers, particularly when it comes to this. So I think, yeah, I was more like... My aim was more to provoke reflections than questions. So. Okay, thank you so much.